Welcome, everyone. I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the host of the Angelo Robles podcast and the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. Today's video we're really excited about investing in disruptive innovation, blockchain, fintech, decentralized finance, DeFi, a VC's perspective. I've been really looking to have the special guests that we have on today on for a long time. It's great that our schedules coincided. And that would be Jalik Jubin Putra, founder, founding partner of Future Perfect Ventures. Jalik, how are you? I, I'm doing well. Thanks for having me on. Of course, of course. It's great to see you. And you're going to be really one of the best guests on this diversified series of disruptive innovations that I could think of. So really, it's great to have you on. We're going to cover a lot. And I know for some of you in the family office community, this may get a little deep in certain issues. I'm going to circle back as to why towards the end. I think that's incredibly important. But I'll give you a hint. If you're not at least abreast of these, I'm not saying you have to be an expert, you don't. But if you're not aware of it, you're gonna miss out over the next, right now, the next five or 10 years is gonna be game changing. Uh, you, your family, your family office, there's opportunities to be involved. That is among the best that I've ever seen relative to this aspect of the community. And I don't want you all to miss out. So here we go. The impact of Facebook changing the name of Libra to Diem. What impact do you think that this could have? Not necessarily the name change, although, although that may be a subtle question, but simply Diem in general. Well, Facebook, uh, with the announcement of their uh, crypto, uh, or I shouldn't even call it a crypto, I, I, it's really more of a digital currency versus a cryptocurrency, um, they really made a lot of waves and, and I think attracted uh, the attention of regulators around the world because regulators all of a sudden took notice of the fact that a private company could potentially issue a new currency, reach 2 billion people, around the world, turn it on and create their own economy. Um, and, and I viewed it uh, very much as a uh, kind of a light rod, lightning uh, rod for uh, regulation uh, when it was first announced uh, because of that competitive nature uh, to fiat currencies. Um, and we've certainly seen that play out over the last uh, year and a half that uh, they've been attempting to launch and they've been through several iterations of white papers. Uh, they started off with a very decentralized um, or a decentralized thesis, turned it a little bit more into a centralized model. Uh, first, it was backed by a basket of currencies. Then it was uh, pegged uh, primarily to the US dollar. So they're really kind of testing out regulation, I think, in real time. Uh, and DM and the name change is, is just certainly another example of that. I mean, this is all so new and, and, and different. And, and it's really, I mean, we've seen obviously technology and information uh, start to attract regulation, but when you start to touch money and currency, and that's when it becomes, I think, really more urgent. And, and we're seeing that. Um, Look, I, I think it's it's uh, it's a powerful uh, thing to say that you know private companies can can issue currencies. Um, gaming companies have been doing that for a while, like uh, mm -hmm. within their their entities. But once if you can start to interoperate that private currency with fiat currency and switch in and out. Uh, it could get really, really interesting. And, and um, so I, I think, you know, look, they're moving ahead with the launch. A lot of people thought this was going to be dead, but they're, they're certainly at it. Um, and I would say um, this goes into a thesis that we put together, you know, six, seven years ago, which is, you know, the advertising model is going to start to fade away and there's going to be new business models that are going to emerge. And I think, you know, if you look at technology companies creating payments arms or technologies, and, and this is why fintech um, is getting so much attention, um, you know, these transactions and payments could be the the primary business models of, of the future versus advertising. So we're seeing a huge shift happening, you know, it's not going to happen overnight, but the fact that, you know, Facebook keeps 
keeps moving ahead with, with this digital currency shows how important this is to uh, uh, their future business model. No, that's that's excellent. And yes, your thesis, in my opinion, would have been 100% correct looking back a couple of years ago. And I think people, I wanted to start with that question a little bit unusual, but you hinted at it in the open of your comment, 2 billion. That's 2 billion people. I mean, it must have scared the hell out of governments, regulators, central banking, and all of that. And like you said, we thought it was dead. And I think kudos to them that they're actually being creative. They've adapted it. They're moving forward. But we're certainly in very, very interesting times. Do you think that Diem could be a threat to Bitcoin? So I, I think they serve very, very different purposes. Um, if you look at, I mean, Bitcoin has really emerged as a store of value, um, a, a digital gold. Um, it was created um, as uh, kind of an alternative currency, a, a way to transact uh, with low fees across borders. I mean, that's why I got interested in it in, in 2013. I was born in Kenya. Um, I had spent a lot of time, I have spent a lot of time in the emerging markets. And um, I was very familiar with M-Pesa and, and this uh, mobile uh, wallet and currency um, that people could use that were you know, unbanked. And it was very low fee uh, because there's a technology back end to it. Now, Bitcoin to me was the equivalent of M-Pesa, but, but not controlled by a government or a company uh, but, uh, but, but controlled by a network of computers that um, uh, controlled by people who had incentives to make sure the system worked. Um, and, and so that is very independent of, like I said, any one company. Um, Diem uh, it is to me more of a uh, payments mechanism, a, an easier way to transact across borders, but maybe at higher scale, probably not as decentralized. So there is risk of, of government control coming in in a way that I think you know, is much tougher to do with Bitcoin. And, and Bitcoin is very unique. In, in, in this way, um, in, in that, you know, a lot of people have been um, uh, critical of how it has taken too long to scale or, you know, it should be scaling quicker from um, uh, in, in terms of what they can do with some of the underlying protocol. But, um, you know, they have really valued security and, and this decentralization as a core tenant of, uh, of, of the Bitcoin uh, blockchain. And, and so we'll see other blockchains, both public and private across the centralization and decentralization uh, uh, spectrum that will serve different purposes. And, and so I think they, they are both very, very different entities, um, at least as of now and in the foreseeable future. Do you think that the blockchain is immutable? Well, when you say the blockchain, it depends on which blockchain you're talking about. Um, so I, I do think the Bitcoin blockchain as of now is the most secure um, uh, blockchain that exists. I, I think, you know, having having test having been tested for for 10 years now um, and and becoming more and more decentralized, getting more usage, more hash rates, it, it, it's it's really been incredible to see. Um, you know, in the early days, everybody was worried about that 51% attack. Um, and, and that has, has really started to wane in terms of concerns. But, but 2013, um, you know, that was a big concern. Uh, but, but we've seen it work. Um, and, and so, I, you know, look, I think there are other, other blockchains that have had those 51% attacks. Um, so I wouldn't put all blockchains in one category. I think it's really important to look at the underlying decentralization, who controls the nodes, how it's transpired over time, um, which is you know, why I think Bitcoin has become this store of value because it's been the, the most tried and, and tested. And you know, in, in some ways, the most simplistic, you know, beautiful <laughs> uh, application of, of blockchain technology. 
That is most definitely for sure and certainly very well said. And again, I want to do much, much more than simply Bitcoin, but that does play a part in terms of what we're talking about. So staying on that a little bit, you mentioned what the nodes, and again, we're not going to get too technology centric, but that's nodes and miners. Would there be some concern that it's so centric because of low power to China that if China were to identify and nationalize them, that, that might be an issue? Well, look, I mean, there, there are a lot of countries uh, that have been attracting, you know, my, mining capabilities. I mean, all over the U.S., um, you know, there's states uh, like Texas, like Wyoming. Um, even and we should. York, yes, I agree with that. <laughs> offering, you know, in, incentives um, uh, for, for miners. So, you know, I, I think it's... Um, I, you know, making sure that the power supply is, is not only cheaper, but also um, consistent, right, is, is an important piece of this. Um, and I'm also excited about greener mining technologies. I, I started off my venture career at Intel uh, Capital in the late 90s, so looked at a lot of semiconductor technology. I mean, I was, you know, at the number one um, uh, semiconductor uh, company in the world. For, for many years. And, and so, um, you know, just looking at uh, the developments um, in, in semiconductors and mining capabilities. So I, I don't think power, you know, power is an important piece, but um, I mean, there, there are going to be other developments within technology that you have to look at holistically. Um, and, um, you know, China's also certainly focused on its own uh, digital currency um, that they're moving very quickly on, um, uh, you know, and, and I'm sure they're going to continue to look at Bitcoin and, and it's, it's, I think Bitcoin is of national security interest to, to all countries in, in the world. And, and I'd be surprised if there was a country out there um, that isn't looking at, at Bitcoin and Bitcoin mining. And in terms of what do you think about the impact potentially of quantum computing on Bitcoin and maybe more shorter term, and again, I'm trying not to get too technical in the weeds, but factoring algorithms. Yeah, so look, I, I, there's, um, I mean, what, what really makes the Bitcoin blockchain and, and blockchains in general and, and crypto uh, currencies in general really unique is their ability to uh, to issue the and mine these new currencies uh, using computer processing power. So any developments in, in computer processing um, or algorithms that can impact faster processing um, uh, will impact uh, the the sector. But but I I've been asked this question for you know, seven, eight years now. Um, and, and I just think back to the early days of the internet. I started investing in, in tech in 95. Um, and, and the early questions were, well, you know, this, uh, this is going to be a threat or that's going to be a threat or this is never going to happen. And what I've seen over time is that, you know, these technologies people tend to, and, and this is a well-known quote from someone and I don't know who it is, you, you tend to, um, uh, going to overestimate the short term impact and underestimate the long term impact. So, so the technologists working on crypto and Bitcoin are not staying static, right? Uh, there's a worldwide community working on on uh, the software, the hardware, all across the spectrum. Um, and, and so I think they'll start to incorporate, you know, new new uh, algorithms and, and uh, technologies as they emerge. Um, and as a side note there, I think COVID has also shown us that um, there's a lot of the world that even in the United States um, that still hasn't been digitized. A lot of industries that have not been digitized. So if you were to say, well, you know, AI is going to take over everything. Well, th there are, uh, there's still companies and, and, and uh, industries using facts. And, and I mean, I've gotten asked for you know, facts. <laughs> it's hard to imagine. <laughs> you know, and, and so I, I, I think, you know, we have to really look at whether, um, I, I think it's a threat, but it, it's a longer term threat. And I think the industry is going to adapt uh, uh, along the way. Okay, so we covered, you know, a bit of Bitcoin because we have to crypto a little bit of blockchain and probably my surprise question on the Facebook and DM. 
but a little bit more impactful to what we're looking to talk about on disruptive innovation. Uh, talk a little bit about the impact of the new Banking Act on stable coins. And maybe let's take a little bit of a step back for those that do not know what are stable coins. Stable coins are kind of digital representations of a, um, of, of, uh, so I'd say of, of a fiat currency, it could be a digital representation of um, any, any fiat, it could be a basket of fiats, uh, as long as they're backed by some assets, um, which have been used as a tool to on-ramp and off-ramp um, people into cryptocurrencies. So, you know, right now, if I want to buy a Bitcoin and do it through my bank account, I, I have to, um, and. I have to have that bank account and then I have to um, uh, wait until that money clears and then buy that, that Bitcoin or Ethereum uh, that, I, that I want to. And stable, uh, what I can do with a stable coin is buy a, the USDC is an example of a US dollar backed stable coin. I can buy that stable coin at any time, convert that over um, on an exchange uh, over to uh, a, a, a digital currency of my choice. Um, and, and so it, it's allowed people to have access to these digital assets um, and, and store some of their fiat value in, in a digital asset that can easily convert, but without having the volatility of say overnight um, exchange rate risks and um, with the cryptocurrencies. So they become a really uh, important piece of the ecosystem in terms Absolutely. of adoption. And uh, changing directions a little bit, and we'll bounce around a little bit on this. Uh, and I'll probably have a couple of questions on this one more in the fintech community. So wait, the, you did ask, sorry, you did ask. Oh, about the, the, the effect the of the act, banking. Right? Yes, so, yes, the banking law. So so the bank, this is just proposed over the last week and it's created a bit of a, a kind of an uproar in, in the crypto world where um, there's legislation that probably will not be looked at in, in, in this congressional session. Um, uh, because of time constraints, but that that would um, mandate that any stable coin issuer would have to have a banking license. And so any technology company that's creating, you know, a stable coin and and you could argue that uh, Facebook's DM or DM, I think they're trying to get away from labeling it Facebook, um, but DM could be uh, because they're they, they're backed by um, by the U.S. dollar uh, would be considered a stable coin and therefore would have to have a banking license. Uh, so so the the industry a lot of startups are creating stable coins or creating technology to create stable coins. So so this is something that's being looked at very very closely by the industry. It's another layer of legislation and cost. Um, that any companies that are issuing these stable coins uh, would have to undergo and a, a level of a scrutiny uh, on an ongoing basis. So, so this is definitely something important to look at. Um, but, I, but you know, the industry is certainly going to debate this um, and, and push back on this. I mean, for sure. But you look at, you know, even broadly in the Bitcoin and crypto world, uh, that you're starting to see banks get involved in custody and not just mm -hmm. Fidelity Digital and Anchorage and others, and look at the state of Wyoming and how creative they've been. Look at Kraken with the first crypto bank. Yes. I think these are all tremendous positives that are happening in the industry. You will start to see some of the classic big banks who are very discreetly already more active in blockchain than some of them want to admit, start to become very, very active in the community. And this is only going to be good, I think, yes. for the growth. Will it mean more Regulation, yes, and from a libertarian perspective, that does get frustrating. But in this field, and generally banking and finance in general, and I would apply this to the exchanges to buy cryptocurrency, I think it's needed. Uh, you know, it's not easy for me to say that, but I, I, I think for the most part, I think it helps 
it's going to inevitably help institutions want to be more active as investors in this community. And family offices have always been first, going back decades and decades into alternatives. And there's going to be a first mover advantage. But inevitably, unless horrific regulation comes in from the government, uh, institutions will get involved. And then this industry will completely you know, explode. And it, you and I probably think that'll be incredibly exciting. <laughs> Absolutely. I mean, we, we've always been proponents of, of working with legislators um, because we don't want them to legislate in, in a vacuum. Um, so a lot of my last seven years in the industry has been um, talking to regulators around the world and, and uh, making sure that they're aware of the positive impacts of, of, of this technology and the dig digitization that, that's occurring in finance in general, um, instead of having a knee-jerk reaction of, of, of just over-legislating. And, and so uh, we have found over the last year that, that regulatory um, clarity has uh, spurred more, more institutions uh, to, to get involved, uh, to invest in the sector. Um, you know, I think as an investor, I certainly uh, welcome a, a certain amount of clarity um, as long as it's not overreaching um, in terms of, um, you know, uh, hindering the, the innovation. But I do think that, you know, the cat's out of the bag here. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's, it's not going back. <laughs> and, and I, uh, you know, just today the G7, um, you know, had crypto uh, and digital currencies on their agenda. And, you know, that that was not that wouldn't have happened two years ago. <laughs> no, and I'm going to save central bank uh, digital currency crypto probably for my discussion with Raul Paul this Thursday. Uh, but I would like to take a sidebar for a minute or two. And, and I'm sure you're going to completely agree, but I would love to also hear your opinion. I've been a little in general disappointed in the single family office community, which again has often been early movers or shakers, although usually that's a small percentage of them. In the surveys and work that I'm doing, they're not as far along as I would like to see in crypto, blockchain, and DeFi. And I'm telling you, this is where things are headed. This is going to be, this is great for your fund. This is going to be the place to be. And I'm tired of this excuse. So I interviewed a billionaire at one of my events in New York a couple of weeks ago, uh, weeks ago, years ago, I'm sorry, 2017. And basically with no knowledge at all, just, well, you know, what do you think about Bitcoin and cryptocurrency? Oh, you know, I'm a, I'm a, I invest in private companies and real estate, and this is hocus pocus with technology. There was no research. There was no thesis that went into that at all. It was just I'm older, this is how I do things, and this is how it's gonna be. If you have that perspective as an investor in a family office, it, it's your world is gonna be so rocked by what's happening in the next three to five years. Forget even 10 or 15 years, COVID actually pushed this along. You owe it to yourself and your family to at least be fluid enough to have a conversation. And here's what you're gonna to start to see in a year or two. I know because I'm gonna push it along. You're gonna to start to see family offices in their investment team with their CIO or under them start to hire experts in digital assets and DeFi, because there's going to be tremendous asymmetrical return opportunity that is going to be hard to get. And I can make an argument for either inflation or deflation, where it's going to get really rocky, I think, over the next couple of years. But you want that asymmetric return. You want to be a part of the future. This is it. And ignorance of you don't want to spend a couple of days doing research on it. I'm sorry. I'm probably sounding a little rude to people. That's not going to cut it. What do you think? <laughs> Well, look, I, I have to say, I, I'm lucky that I had um, some really forward thinking family offices in our first two funds, um, because that was really when um, a lot of folks, even out in Silicon Valley, weren't believers in, in, in the fact that digital assets were, were here to stay. So, um, you know, I have that perspective, but I would say 99% of, of uh, the investors I talk to, including, and I'd say family offices are the bulk of, of who I talk to. Um, although that, that's certainly changing because the um, uh, endowments are, are getting a lot more active right now. Um, uh, they they are still afraid of, of, of the sector or or the, their lack of knowledge um, uh, about the sector and and my answer to that is that's why you have people either on staff or you delegate out exactly 
your your um, your your fund investments um, because this is a sector that is 24/7. Uh, it's only accelerating in terms of innovation. It's open source. It's global. It's I, I mean, I live and breathe this. Um, and, and so, you know, I understand that perspective of, of feeling like you can't stay on top of it, but, but um, I, I think that's where you can also be really left behind. And obviously I'm biased because I, I, I run a fund, but I strongly believe this more than ever that, you know, the, you know, the experts, uh, if you pick your managers well, um, or one or two experts in house well, um, it, it, it'll reap a lot of uh, uh, rewards um, in, in terms of knowledge as well, obviously, as, as, as pure returns. And, and trust me on this, you heard it from here first, literally in this podcast, you will start to see families in their investment office hire experts in crypto and digital innovation, the future of finance, and it's going to be needed. This is where the returns, there, I could argue several asymmetrical bets, but are really going to come from. And it simply is the future. You just have to be obvious and wake up to it. And you don't have to become a technologist or an expert. I think I became relatively fluid effectively in a couple of weeks. I just dedicated myself to what's going to be my thesis, and maybe it was going to be negative. It's positive, although I do have some concerns, but we'll save that for a bit of a different time. Let's talk a little bit, and I think this all relates, what happened with COVID has accelerated things so much, nothing, nothing more than the future of work. What I mean by that is more the impact of innovation in financial services and all of that that's going on now. I mean, this is a big open-ended question for you, but I would love to listen and hear what you think and maybe how things are shaping up from an investing perspective on that. Yeah, so it's, um, again, I'm gonna go back to our thesis. And uh, so when I, when I launched- At least you uh, have one, that's good. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I launched our, our fund in 2013, um, it, it was after you know being a VC since 99, um, uh, starting off in, in the Valley and, and uh, investing around the world, um, I was, a, a, a TMT investment banker before that in New York and London. And um, I started the fund because I saw a bunch of gaps in, in the VC landscape. And, and one was that I felt like we were primed for a real tech evolution. And, and that's really equivalent to our, our thesis around blockchain tech and, and crypto and, and digital currencies. Um, and, and the other part of the, the thesis was um, I have a very global background and I didn't understand why early stage investors were only investing in their backyard. And well, I do understand because most of them don't have these networks globally that, that I've been able to build up over, over these years. But um, so we have been operating on a very kind of um, a, a hybrid model since, since we started the fund. And in terms of, um, you know, we, we did used to like to meet the people at least uh, once that we invested in uh, the entrepreneurs. Um, uh, but but we're, we're used to doing uh, things on Zoom. Um, it, it, it really wasn't that much of a change for us. And then I realized that, you know, for most VCs, it really was a big change and, and most people in the world because uh, they uh, were not used to doing business over Zoom. Um, and, and so I would say that, that if you look at crypto, blockchain, it's been global, it's been open source. There are lots of things that have been different than prior kind of technology evolutions. And, and that was just part of our thesis from, from the beginning. So it's played into you know, what we do really, really well. And I think the rest of the world is realizing that um, you know, whether, I mean, we will go back to in-person meetings, but there's a lot that can be done um, uh, you know, outside of that. And, and we will certainly think about um, where can we find the best talent and, and they don't necessarily have to be physically located. Um, and I, I think if you want to bring that a little bit further, if you look at why blockchain tech is interesting, right? It, it, it's it's uh, uh, being able to create trust through algorithms. Um, and, and as you get to more remote work, um, and I think about credentialing, right? Like um, if I'm, if I'm uh, working with someone who's halfway around the world, but I, I, I want to work with them, but how, how do I know that they're credentialed properly? And right now the solutions aren't very good. You've either gone to certain schools 
or you know, you're, you're an unknown um, or you, you're recommended by somebody. Now think of how much human capital you can open up if there was a trusted verifiable way um, to, to know that person has worked on these projects um, or if they have this certain skill set and it's been verified by you know other other people. And, and so again, looking beyond just Bitcoin, if I, I think about the excite the exciting elements of, of uh, this technology and the world we're moving into, uh, it's very well suited. Um, and and I, I think we're just going to see uh, companies building on some of this um, uh, and, and it started off with fraud or, you know, uh, a more of a, you know, a how, how do we counteract um, uh, uh, bad actors or how do we create more control of our money? But we're just like the Internet has reached into places we never thought, you know, we, we didn't imagine possible. The same thing is going to happen with this technology. It's just going to happen much quicker uh, because it's so global and open source. Anyone can build on it. Yeah, that's very well said. And in terms of more so on fintech and broadly the future of work, uh, yes, that also creates opportunity for employees to have any employer they want to work for, whether contracting or working directly. But how do you think the impact could be? I mean, look at the banking industry, uh, the days of the brick and mortar, the expensive real estate and buildings. You just don't need that anymore. I am of the belief that I think actually banks are going to adapt relatively well part of it and led by some of the brands we know, JP Morgan, Goldman, one, they're incredibly influential. So they're going to have some impact on regulation. Let's just be honest. That's just a reality. And, of and a lot of people think, you know, the stablecoin regulation may, may have been spearheaded by, by some of uh, the, the existing, you know, financial. And services. I think so, by the way. So you, I didn't want to quite say that. But the answer is yes. And the irony is I'm not saying that this is bad. I actually think there's going to be some benefits to it. Imagine being able to custody a lot of your resources. And that's the problem that people often have with larger scale purchases of Bitcoin and crypto, although Fidelity and Anchorage are getting more well known for what they do. But imagine if some of the bigger players get involved eventually one day soon, I think an ETF is going to be approved. That also is going to bring institutions in. That's going to bring RIAs offering it to their clients. It's going to be shorting. I mean, there's we're right on the cusp. I hope you all can see this. I know I'm a little bit excited about it. Uh, talk a little bit about Actually, speaking of banking, uh, will banking as a service with companies like Stripe, who's amazing, uh, are they going to revolutionize the banking industry? Yeah, so this, this whole con concept of embedded finance, and it, it's, it's going back to what I had mentioned earlier of um, you know, transactions and payments as new business models for every company. I mean, you're, you're, you've seen Google relaunch, Google Pay. I mean, we we're, we talk about Facebook already, and um, and and so uh, the ability what, what Stripe has enabled is uh, the ability for you know, e-commerce companies to ramp up uh, a, a payment system, and and now they're doing that uh, with their announcement over, over the last couple of weeks uh, with banking services. So. Um, you know, imagine if any website could then offer you the ability to to get a loan or, you know, uh, uh, and, and they're doing this in, in conjunction with Goldman. So I think that's also very telling is that you're seeing a lot of yes. partnerships right, between financial institutions and and um, these more you know technology oriented uh, uh, fintech startups. And that that's something we we haven't seen as much of until the last few years. So. Um, I, I think this is just like in a golden age for um, for you know looking at uh, finance uh, and, and its role in, in different business models, and we're going to see more of these partnerships, um, and and these are going to be important business models of, of the future, and and the ability to offer also micro payments, right? Um, uh, with, which instead of going through credit cards and Visa is also very active now in, in, in the crypto and digital asset space in, in a way that they weren't even two or three years ago. They've always had folks, um, they've been investing in the sector, they've had folks focused on it, but they've really ramped up their programs and working with the sector because they realize that there can be a real threat to 
to their infrastructure unless they figure out a way to use some of this new technology in conjunction with their you know, credit card networks that they, they've already established. Um, so we're, we're definitely going to see these partnerships uh, ramp up. And, and then I wanna go back to the underserved and the underbanked and the unbanked, right? Um, we have that, a lot of that in the United States, especially post 2008 crisis. Um, and, and it certainly exists, you know, most of the world um, uh, does not have banking, bank accounts or traditional bank accounts. And this technology is going to leapfrog um, and it's happened, I mentioned Kenya, um, but we're, I mean, I have done a lot in India too. There's an incredible amount of uh, FinTech innovation happening around the world. And some of those models are actually coming back to the US. Um, and, and so I, I just think the next, the next five years, um, you know, we're going to see innovation. Yes, the larger, the smart larger companies um, and financial institutions are are going to be very involved. They already are. Um, they could be acquirers or partners with with our portfolio, and and we we think that's that's the positive thing. Which is kind of a reason why the whole thing about Bitcoin and all of that, it's not going to go away, 99% sure. There is some concerns with government intervention, which I'll get to in future podcasts, but too many very quietly of the kind of companies that you just noted are just so involved now. You, it, you can't go back. Maybe 10 years ago, you could have early on. Uh, and these companies are being very active in partnering, like you said. This is here to stay. Again, if your thesis was basically not doing research and poo-pooing it, that's uh, completely unacceptable. And I'm not- Well, the good it. news is we're still very early, so there's- plenty. And it's still very early. And what I would say, you know, not to get a little too scary on people, but if you are in your 60s or 70s, oh, this is again, 10, 20, 30 years out. One, it's not, it's here right now. And it's an opportunity for you to get back and make money. Uh, but probably what we're gonna have in medical and health and biotech, we're likely, who knows, we're likely gonna have significant advancements, especially for the wealthy. Maybe you'll live an extra 30 or 40 years. And this is, it, do you wanna be stuck as a dinosaur, as a relic of the past? There's probably gonna be trillionaires that could be in time created out of this. Do you wanna be a part of it or not? Uh, I do want to and, talk and about. I, I can speak from experience. It keeps you. It keeps you young, <laughs> because <laughs> you're on the cutting edge. And I mean, you know, there are days when it can age you. You know, ten years, and and then you know, you you reverse that in, in the next uh, couple of days. <laughs> I promise everyone we are going to talk about decentralized finance, DeFi. But before we do that, you're a successful fund manager. All the things we're talking about, you're investing in entrepreneurs and companies that are actually doing it. I think our audience would love to hear, why don't you pick maybe two or three of them and walk us through the thesis that you might have had to invest, the founders, and what they're doing to change the landscape and be you know, in digital finance? Sure. Uh, so one of our earliest investments um, at, out of this fund uh, is in 2014 in a company called uh, Bitpesa, which is now known as AZA. Uh, the, the founder came from uh, the, uh, the emerging market finance uh, world uh, and, and was based in Nairobi at the time. I already mentioned that one of the reasons I got really excited about Bitcoin uh, when I was first exposed to it was that I started thinking of how it could be this bit pass, uh, sorry, this uh, M-Pesa for, for the rest of the world, the, this mobile wallet that you could transact and you didn't have to have a physical bank account. Um, you could transmit money, um, uh, you know, long distances without in, in Kenya, you know, otherwise they would have to travel for days sometimes to settle a transaction. Um, and, and so, um, she, uh, Elizabeth, the, the founder, uh, w was very much thinking the same thing and, uh, and building uh, an, an FX uh, mechanism uh, uh, based on the Bitcoin blockchain. Um, so right, right now, with, with the corresponding banking system, if you want to transfer money even from one country in Africa to another country on the continent, sometimes it can go onshore and offshore uh, uh, three, four, five times uh, because of the different relationships. 
and, and it can take weeks to settle that transaction, um, not to mention all the fees that are layered on. So th those fees could go up to 20, 20% 20 plus sometimes. And so that took out a lot of um, uh, transactions that, that could have been possible. Um, uh, and, and so uh, that was a thesis that we were very like focused on as, as a use case very early on, right? Um, while the underlying technology was built, being built out for scale, uh, for you know, trading and other things, we thought this was something that could be used right away. And, and they've just been growing uh, you know, phenomenally. And I'd say COVID has accelerated their growth. Um, I mean, it's accelerated digital payments worldwide, but when there's a dollar shortage uh, in March, uh, people were able to use AZA's system um, where you know you weren't reliant on on the dollar as a settlement uh, mechanism, and um, and and that was I, I think one of the first times since they launched where that was you know that was a very obvious like byproduct of what they had built uh, in terms of people understanding. Um, you know, who may not have otherwise understood all the all the challenges of uh, of uh, uh, what they were solving, but that was a very obvious one in March. Um, another company that's a newer investment. I'll pick one that you know we we've been in for a while, and then a newer investment is called Vendia, um, and they just emerged out of stealth. We were one of their first investors. Uh, they're out in Silicon Valley. And um, the, the founders both come from Amazon Web Services. Um, and um, the uh, gentleman who started their serverless um, computing uh, division called Lambda is one of the founders. And the other is, is a woman who uh, uh, was the head of blockchain for AWS. And, and they left recently and started this company to use, um, so, you know, I talked about settlement of, of um, transactions in, in a monetary sense. The other exciting thing to me about blockchain tech when I first saw it was the fact that you, you could actually settle data transactions with this technology and that's what they're doing. So right now, you know, data, uh, we've seen this with supply chain data, be lagging and, and not knowing where different products are, it's because uh, all this data resides in different databases, depending on the company. It could be, again, pen and paper. It could be uh, PDFs. It, it could be a, an SAP um, or an Oracle database. And so what they're able to do is, is settle data transactions um, almost instantaneously. It's pretty much instantaneous. I mean, unless you get really technical about, you know, micro, micro, micro seconds. Um, and and do it and uh, do it with unstructured and structured data. And this is a problem that I've seen since I've been investing uh, since the late '90s. Um, but it's only accelerated because of the amount of data that's being created and and the fact that there's so many smaller companies, larger companies trying to interact and do business. And and so uh, one of their first customers is is a company that settles uh, airline tickets. Uh, uh, transactions with the code shares and, and just being able to reconcile uh, uh, what's owed to whom. And um, that used to take weeks and they brought it down to hours. Um, so they're just at the early, early days of, of uh, uh, seeing a lot of traction, but that's a non, I'd say, again, it goes back to transactions, but different types of transactions that can be settled using this technology. And how many companies do you have in your fund? So we have uh, 43 portfolio companies be between uh, two funds. Soon okay, so that's, that's pretty diversified in terms of the industry that you're in. And I suppose from a thesis perspective, I mean, I mean it's, the, it's the old adage of the asymmetrical risk. What you could lose is the investment in the company, but the potential upside is significantly more than that. In some more than others, and some are going to be a little more conservative. Uh, so you probably have to weigh all of that in terms of looking at the, the collective of your investments that are part of your funds. And now that you've been at this for multiple years, you're able to show uh, some of the successes and what you've accomplished, which is truly great. I mean, like you said in the your passion comes through that, you know, this is still really, really early in terms of what's going on. It must be really exciting for you to meet these entrepreneurs and the great ideas they have and 
tough to make decisions because you can't invest in everyone that you meet. That, that, that's true. And, and you know, I feel extremely fortunate to, to be, have been involved twice in my career. Hopefully there'll, there'll be you know, a third uh, evolution or revolution, tech revolution, <laughs> but to see the early days of the internet and then uh, to see you know, the early days of, of the crypto and blockchain sector has just been phenomenal. And, um, and we do look at diversification. Um, you know, we, we look at you know, finance applications. We look at some of these more infrastructure um, uh, build outs, uh, middleware. Um, we're an investor in the graph, which, um, which allows developers to see data across blockchains um, and, and build that into their, um, their applications. So, you know, as much as this is all very new, there are certain things that, I mean, you look at market adoption and again, it may be accelerated, but it follows certain paths. And, and so, um, you know, I've been fortunate to have seen that happen with the internet and, and uh, apply some of the same frameworks, but also realize, you know, when things are different this time around. Um, but, but, you know, a lot stays the same uh, in terms of you can't rush human adoption. Um, and, and you have to really look at market conditions too when you're when you're an you know when you're managing a fund. Yeah, I mean I'm only internally chuckling. <laughs> external now. Just look at the last really 30 to 40 years with the internet and with blockchain. I mean, two of the most just game-changing things relatively in kind of the same time frame. And in our lifetimes, even if we live to be 150, we may never see something quite like what has evolved over the last 10 years and what could be, you know, as again, it gets more adapted, more institutions come in. I mean, this, this is, a, again, a really interesting time. We are getting a question in before I get to D5 from one of our live participants. How would you compare or contrast your fund and its focus to that of Stevens Brothers Blockchain Capital? Oh, yeah. They're, um, look, there are about four of us, uh, you know, in the in the early days. Uh, the Stevens brothers with, with Brock Pierce, um, Barry Silver, um, and uh, we, we, you know, and us. Um, and and so we we've co-invested a lot over the years together. Um, you know, I have a lot of respect for them and what they've done in the industry. They have a great portfolio. You know, I, I have been a tech investor for a really long time. So I would say, you know, while we do have some overlap in, in what we invest in, I also look at AI and, um, and IoT as part of our decentralized thesis. So a company like Vendia, um, you know, the other investors are all um, enterprise VCs from the Valley. Um, and we saw that with uh, Brain Trust, which just raised uh, a round from um, a, a number of crypto funds, but we were in there first with um, kind of more, uh, I'd say, traditional tech VC funds. So uh, I think we we offer some exposure um, to to companies um, that that may not use blockchain tech as as the core, but incorporate the technology, um, and especially in in the early days of some of those companies. So I, I've also you know, have a number of companies in, in the pipeline that come from entrepreneurs that I invested in, you know, 15 years ago um, uh, during during the internet or early kind of API days. Um, and, and, and that are using some blockchain principles and crypto principles, but are, are more, you know, fintech, uh, would, would go more in the fintech category. So I'd say that's where, you know, where, where the, the most different, although there is some overlap, I'd say, you know, we, we have a pretty, diff, I mean, quite, quite a different portfolio. Yeah, that's well said. And, you know, Jalik, I'm showing my age. I remember both of the names you noted, Brock and Barry, before they were in Bitcoin and crypto. Yeah. I remember when Brock, he spoke at one of my LA events, had to be a good 10 years ago in gaming. He's a very good speaker. Being a former actor, he has a good stage presence. Uh, and Barry, I mean, he's probably one of the largest owners of crypto, if not the largest, maybe, and uh, Bitcoin specifically. And imagine if that really explodes, which it very well might. Who knows? Five, 10, 15 times. 
uh, just amazing. And Barry spoke at one of my events about crypto at the Westchester Country Club. Had to be 2016, and he's great. We had Michael Schonenheim uh, from Grayscale on just a couple of weeks ago, and that was a lot of fun. Let's switch over a little bit to decentralized finance known as DeFi. Why don't we start like we did with some others, and we didn't have time to get into tokenization today. Maybe we'll save that one for a bit of a different time. But what is the definition of DeFi? And before you give it, this is like the hottest subject in the community right now. And this goes back to what I said about you may have heard of it, but you don't know about it. That ignorance is unacceptable. You have to educate yourself about it because the potential of DeFi is earth shattering. Tell us why. So, the whole Bitcoin spearheaded the whole concept of um, validating transactions through through computers. Then Ethereum came along and and uh, added a layer of programmability and smart contracts. So if something happens, then this transaction executes and and offering that layer on onto um, blockchain technology. And and so DeFi. And it takes that principle and applies it to, to finance. So lending, um, you know, any sort of, uh, and any banking function uh, that now requires intermediaries or say, you know, you want to uh, uh, potentially um, uh, buy, you know, buy a house and, and have it appraised and, and, you know, have certain elements of that or all of it be be automated without having people come in and, and do the verifications. You can take data in from different sources and, and say, you know, appraise that place. And, and then you can put lending conditions on top of it. And, mm -hmm. and so it's this automation of, of finance in a, in a way that to its extreme doesn't require any human or company uh, intermediation. Uh, so there doesn't have to be a company in the middle. I could transact directly with you and know that uh, the transaction is only happening according to certain um, uh, certain contracts that that we've been agreed to, we've agreed to, or that are programmed in. And so there are companies that are creating, you know, all sorts of contracts or and 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 kind of derivative products, and and it's starting off a lot with lending. Um, but right. the, the possibilities are endless, and I'd say endless beyond what finance offers today. Um, and 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 frankly, it's all happened even quicker than I thought it would, and it's been yeah. accelerated by by COVID. Um, I think in in that we've seen. Well, there are a few things. I mean, there's COVID and and um, people needing to put their money to work because we're in a very you know low yield environment in general. We have been for a while, um, but that's only accelerating. And and so all of these different types of products, financial products that are possible out of this, uh, can potentially offer a lot more yield. And, and um, you can do it through owning certain tokens. So companies are issuing tokens, then you can stake them, um, you know, and, and um, lend them out. And, and it, it, there's so many layers of contracts that are happening uh, right now. And I mean, I, I'm really excited about this. I, uh, th this is kind of one of the holy grails of, you know, thinking about what was possible with this is, you know, offering more financial products and assets available to a broader range of people um, out there and, and not having gatekeepers telling you what you uh, can and cannot do with, with your capital and your assets. It's not only financial capital, it's your human capital. You know, there are lots of ways this can go. You can tokenize yourself potentially um, and, and, you know, your skill set. And, and so, and, this all goes back to everything being a transaction potentially uh, through this technology. And, and so, I, I mean, I'm veering off a little bit about like into the, the future, but um, but a lot of it's starting to happen now. And, and we- Yeah, it's we've been accelerated. Up. Like we you said, threw a, a bubble uh, over the summer, um, but you know, just like the 2017 crypto bubble, um, I think there have been a lot of lessons learned. Entrepreneurs, um, you know, the, the the really strong ones have survived and are adapting, and and so 
um, I, I'm seeing like a third generation of DeFi entrepreneurs already emerge, and that's a that's an innovation cycle that's on 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 steroids. And I mean, probably again, not looking to get too technical in the weeds, but often going to be built on Ethereum, uh, a you know now iconic smart uh, blockchain technology, and Ether, the underlying or the on top of that, I guess you could say the cryptocurrency. Uh, talk a little bit, maybe even if it's just a couple of seconds, is that likely to remain or could that adapt away from Ethereum? Well, Ethereum just had a, a, a big uh, milestone and, and they um, uh, re uh, released uh, uh, their, their new uh, blockchain. Um, and, and so, and a lot of people thought, you know, I mean, it's been much delayed. It, it, uh, a lot of people didn't think it was gonna happen this year. Um, I, I think, and any of these blockchains, I mean, one of the principles of, it, of, of success is having the network and the community and developers uh, developing on the blockchain. So then you can offer all these different applications that, that need to use ETH to, to be able to function. And, and so Ethereum definitely has that mind share. Um, of, of a global community of developers. Um, we have a few other contenders that are, you know, offering different, uh, more scalability, uh, you know, uh, less complexity in, in terms of development, um, but those haven't been tested as much yet. And, and so the next couple of years are going to be really important to see. Um, I have always believed there's going to be different blockchains um, that are going to interoperate and you know, just like we have specific companies that are good at, you know, a certain types of software. I mean, will, will, you know, financial software, media, we'll, we'll see that start to emerge. And that's our broader thesis for our next fund and, and beyond. Um, and, and so we'll see different types of assets, um, blockchain assets, as well as companies being built on those, um, those different blockchains. And then that middleware connectivity layer. So, um, so we think that there's going to be lots of investable opportunities. We're not betting on one versus another, and we're certainly staying on top of new ones that are, that are emerging. Boy, did you cue up my next question? And it may be my last, and I may give you a chance for closing comments or more audience interaction. Will DeFi, again, decentralized finance, cause the next Amazon to be built on top of Ethereum or perhaps another network, blockchain? I, I think it's inevitable. The, the big question is, right. <laughs> is, is, is the timing. Um, and um, look, Amazon, Facebook, Microsoft, you know, all these companies are certainly uh, innovating, uh, partnering, uh, trying to figure out, you know, how to defend their business models and then move to the new business models. That is very much happening. They're aware it's going to happen. Um, but I do think there are going to be upstarts emerging. Um, and, and the beauty, I, I think the real beauty of this, and we're, we didn't talk about tokenization, but, but that is a big part of, of um, you know, why we got involved and, and our thesis is, is the fact that you can have broader ownership. You can have um, uh, users also have ownership. I think that's going to create a more stable um, uh, base of companies. Um, and, and so that's like for another session. <laughs> um, but but we, we are going to see new, new, new players emerge who are going to have a broader and, and more stable, I believe, ownership uh, base than what we've seen before. Yeah, this has been really so much fun. It's so exciting. And you were an early pioneer, an early pioneer, it still is only like a couple of years old. So really exciting to talk about this again in some of the research and work that I'm doing. I'm just completely fascinated by it and see such tremendous potential. Will, will there be setbacks? Of course, this is still early stage. Many companies won't make it. But <laughs> to think that we're going to roll back the clock and this is going to go away, it's not. You have to be familiar with Bitcoin, cryptocurrency, blockchain, DeFi, uh, uh, tokenization, and it's not quite as hard. You don't have to be the, the node and miner. That's hard, relatively. You just have to have a base understanding and a good business mind and form a thesis of the decisions that you want to make. And maybe it's under 5% of what you're doing, and I would completely understand but that's better than keeping it at zero in a time when, what do you expect from cash and government bonds? 
especially if we have inflation. I, you could argue deflation that would change that parameter or that uh, my thesis a little bit. This just it only makes the most sense in the world to me. But maybe that's just me. Why don't I give you a minute or two to give kind of a, cl a closing conclusion to our discussion? And for those families who are qualified that would like to learn more about potentially becoming an LP and learning more about your fund, how could they do so? Sure. So um, you can reach me at jalak at fpv.vc. So it's J-A-L-A-K at F pv for future perfect ventures .vc. we also have an ir at fpv.vc mailbox um i'm on twitter at jalik i'm pretty easy to find given my name is a very unusual name there's probably only one of me out there <laughs> in, in the world um, if there's anyone else who, with uh, yeah i'd love to to meet them um uh, but you know we've touched on so many different elements during this conversation i really enjoyed it uh, and uh, you've captured why this is so exciting, and uh, you know I've been in the uh, the tech industry for a long time. Um, I got goosebumps the first time I logged into the internet um, because I was so interested in in you know how technology could enable development and education and offer access to resources um, to people who didn't who didn't have it, and and that's been my driver. And really the underlying driver of, of why I got so excited about blockchain tech and Bitcoin when I, you know, and I got the same goosebumps and it sounds, you know, kind of hokey to say that, but, but it, it's only been a few times in my career and, and those were the two times and I think we're just in the early, early, early stages. So I, I you know, I think it's great for the folks who are interested and involved. Um, you can be an early adopter still you and, and they're different entry points. Um, you know, there are crypto hedge funds that are, you know, that there's definitely alpha there. Um, and, and then, you know, what we do, I, I'd say, you know, we're, we're going to move to, we're doing very early stage investing. We're a 10 year fund, um, but we're, we're increasing our token exposure as that market develops. And, and so um, I think there's a spectrum. Um, and as a fund manager, as, as an investor, I think the liquidity potential um, uh, that will exist out of all of this is one of the most exciting elements if you just look at it from a portfolio management perspective. And, but I do think it's absolutely essential to pick the right managers um, because they're kind of a lot of dilettantes <laughs> in this sector. Um, and, um, you know, the network and, and um, just, just knowing even the short history and, and uh, being connected into uh, the right entrepreneurs for the future is absolutely essential. How true. And maybe as I get my clothes for, it would only apply to our live audience, but if you could type in to the chat feature, your email where the live audience could see it, that may be easier for them to copy and paste. While that's occurring, and I know if you're hearing this on a podcast in weeks out or my YouTube platform a week or two out, it may be a little bit too late, but you could always go back and search it. But for my live audience this week, uh, really excited to have on one of the greatest macro traders ever, a friend of Stan Drunken Miller, of Tudor Jones, the very well-known and amazing Raul Paul, P-A-L. Look him up, follow him on Twitter. He's got probably 400,000 followers. He's amazing. And it's way more than just the new economy in Bitcoin, that the, although that's going to play a part of it. That's this Thursday at four. And then we have another Twitter star in this community, Lynn Alden, coming up on Monday. Lynn is maybe like the best, she's my favorite right now investment strategist and engineer by training. And what she's able to do in terms of her research, amazing. So she's going to be amazing coming up on Monday, the 14th. We have others, Robert Breedlove, who's a deep thought leader in cryptocurrency and very thoughtful coming up uh, the week leading into Christmas. And then someone who may not be as much of an advocate of Bitcoin, but I think he's slowly a little bit coming around, Jim Rickards. And he's an amazing thought leader, an economist, very, very 
bullish on gold, but I, I think starting, unlike my friend Peter Schiff, starting to have a little bit of love to Bitcoin, maybe just a little. We'll find out. And I believe the date of that one is one six. So that's a couple of weeks out on January 6th. In other words, we have amazing guests, including Jalik today upcoming and very, very much look forward to these interviews on bigger picture, central banking, macro trends, Bitcoin, the future of finance, disruptive technologies. The time is now. Now, everyone, I'm Angelo Robles. I'm the host of the Angelo Robles podcast. I'm the founder and CEO at Family Office Association. We're a global membership organization dedicated to families of great wealth and their family offices, hosting events, including obviously hundreds every year digitally for our members, producing original thought leadership and content, and the opportunity for our members and relationships to interact with my Rolodex, my great speakers, and the people that we know that could be of value to them. I will note, because we had somewhat of an investment discussion today, obviously, that one for what we were talking about today, you need to be qualified. That's one thing. Two, you have to do your own diligence. This is meant to be educational. And also, you may hear this a year or two from now, and things change. So it really is applicable, even from an educational perspective, right now at the moment in early December of 2020. You could lose money in any investment, especially one that's going to be a little bit more risky, like what we're talking about in VC. So again, you have your own capability, risk tolerance, all of that, you need to do your own diligence. And I am just reminding all of you. Everyone, again, I'm Angelo Robles. Jalik, it's been great to have you on. Look forward to next time. Thank you. Thank you very much. Take care.